Okay, everybody ready? Yeah, okay. Cool. So let's get started. Um, I know you probably have a lot in your mind with uh, what Kostya just showed, um, but I hope you have a little bit more room for something else. Now, for those who don't know me, I'm Luis Herman, I'm uh, also part of the front end team here. And I'm gonna be talking about um, SSR with React. So this sounds pretty fancy, but uh, so what on earth is SSR? It stands for server side rendering, which is also very fancy, but we're gonna cover what it actually means in, in a bit. So uh, why should you care about this thing called SSR? What does it do? The first thing and the most important thing is that it's gonna look good on your LinkedIn profile. You just have, you're just gonna put it next to your React skills and people's gonna start calling you. So less important stuff, but still good. It's gonna improve your user experience. So this is really, really important because we care about our users. We get the money from there. So uh, it will also improve the SEO, uh, which stands for search engine optimization. And it's also needed for SML, which are uh, a lot of fancy words here, but is uh, social media optimization, which is for Facebook, Twitter, all this stuff. Now, this is just an overview, so you know kind of what to expect, but I'm gonna cover everything into detail, so don't worry about too much. Uh, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> um, Okay, I'll give you a second. Okay, so let this, let's get started. Uh, web applications are a bit different uh, than, for example, Android apps or um, iPhone apps because you have to, you don't have the app downloaded in your device. Uh, so you have to literally download the whole code base of your application to actually see something. So there is a, a very important difference, and that's why the first load of your application, it's really, really important, especially from business uh, business perspective. So when I say first load, I just don't, I not only mean the first time a user opens your website, like literally for the first time, but literally every time that your user opens your website. Uh, there are studies uh, from Amazon and from other big companies that they realize the slower uh, the page seems to low for the users, the conversion starts to drop, and the faster it is, they start to get uh, some percentage in conversion. And this is um, because users feel more satisfied with this. Right now, we've been building an SPA, which stands for Single Page Application, and it kind of looks something like this, the browser-server interaction. We have the browser, and we have a static server which means it's just like a piece of software that is just gonna uh, read the files that it has in the file system and return it to the browser when uh, they're requested. So something like this. We're happy. Uh, in SPA, we have usually uh, just one HTML file. It contains the whole application. And it's kind of like this, which is very, very tiny HTML. It has like pretty much nothing. Everything will be constructed by React. So we have um, inside the body, the div with the ID root, and this is where we're gonna mount our application. And the only, the other important thing is the script tag that's gonna fetch the code of our application. So there is nothing here. As I say, we, um, we take this um, get element by ID, uh, we select it and we mount our app inside this element and then the magic starts. So it kind of looks like this. This is um, uh, by no means uh, exactly as it work in real life. This is a oversimplified version of um, how it will look the resource uh, fetching from from your device and the timings show here are just for illustration purposes 
So don't get mad if they're not exactly to detail. But the first thing that's gonna happen is that your browser is gonna do a DNS resolution, which is it's gonna check on a server uh, this domain name to what IP address uh, is going to match. And after that, it's going to start the actual fetching. Once it starts fetching the HTML, it's going to take a little bit. Our HTML is pretty small in SPA, so it's not going to take too much. After that little HTML is done, it's going to search our JavaScript. And it really depends how big is our app, but if it's uh, actually a big application, it might take a while, especially in 3G. So let's say we're still fetching. And once we're done fetching the, that JavaScript, the browser has to evaluate, like parse this file. And then it's, it's extra time. It's not just downloading a file, it's downloading and then parsing. It's two steps. And usually these two steps combine are um, a long time, especially on a slow device, slow network connection. So it's really, really important that we take this into account. So it's been three seconds. Your user is pretty, pretty bored. He wants to just do something else. He um, changes to listen to Spotify. He starts talking with people. And he forgets about this uh, website that he was opening. So you lost a customer. And this is not good. So by three seconds, we get what we call the first meaningful paint, uh, which means the user can see something at this point. Uh, because we usually fetch some extra data, like we're doing with the e-commerce app that we're fetching the products. Um, the, uh, he's going to see like a skeleton of our app, and then it's going to load for, for fetching the app. But at least at this point, the user is like, OK, I have something. Uh, I'm just going to wait for this to, to, to load. Uh, so this app is interactive, but it's not fully interactive. But this is what we call first meaningful pain. Then once it fetches the rest of the, um, the data, now you can fully use this, this thing. So it could take a while, 3.5 seconds. And like a big, uh, big website, uh, it could take like 20, 30 seconds sometimes for mobile applications to fully get interactive. Um, so this is something we have to consider. And the question is, can we do better? Can we help the user a bit? Because we need to care about these things when we're creating applications. And of course, the answer is yes. And that's why I'm here talking. I'm going to talk about server-side rendering. There's also a link concept to SSR, which is static export or static uh, build app. Um, they're kind of siblings. They're not the same thing, but um, I'm going to explain a bit. So it all relies in these two functions. Um, the one at the top allows you from a Node.js server or a Node.js script to take the same application that you have in React, you pass it as an argument, and it's going to return a string, an HTML version of this of the application just as will your user will see it on the browser. But it, in this case, it's uh, on the Node.js. And the second one is uh, it's similar to React DOM render, uh, but as you see, it's called Hydrate. It's going to do the same thing, but because it already going to have a um, render version of your HTML, is is not going to waste time creating this HTML. It's just going to take, OK, you send me the HTML, just going to attach some event handlers and animations and everything on top. Um, so it's kind of to not waste uh, time with this or CPU cycles. So let's take a little bit, a look of how we can create an, um, a static file, like a HTML from our uh, JavaScript. If we are Node.js, um, there is a model called uh, FS, which allows us to read and write into the file system. Then let's say we import this model called React DOM server. As you see, it's the same um, React DOM. It's inside, it comes with it. Uh, it's just um, slash server. And then let's say we import one of our pages, the one uh, we have like many in this project, but let's say we just import products. Now, what we're going to do is, OK, uh, let's call this React DOM server, render to string, pass the products, 
and we're going to save this into a variable, into a constant. And now we're going to use file system to create products.html and pass this data that we have here. By executing this script, we just created an HTML file that is going to live inside our folder. So now we have a render version of products.html. We will have to do the same for all of our products, including if we have dynamic products, like um, we have to figure out a way how to create this. But just for like um, uh, products.html or like single product, single pages, uh, this is like the approach we will uh, use. This is over, obviously an oversimplified version, uh, but just to give you an idea. Now, this is how look the browser interaction with the server when we're using a static server or a CDN. Uh, does anybody know what a CDN is? Raise of hands. Okay, don't be shy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> do, do you know or you like almost know? No? <laughs> okay. Well, um, CDN is a content delivery network. It's pretty much a static server, but there are like many of them uh, across the world. And basically, um, the closer it is to the user, it will use that specific server to uh, send the content. Uh, static servers on CDN have the advantages of like that you can replicate the data among different servers. Uh, it's going to be cheaper than actually running a server. They're not susceptible to um, denial of service attacks and many other stuff. Um, the downside is that you literally have to have each HTML file that you're uh, compared to every route that you have in your application. So let's say your user goes to products.html, server goes and reads, okay, I need to send this guy products.html, it's gonna find it. Once it finds it, it's gonna read it and send it back to the user and the user is now uh, happy and now he can start fetching the rest of the uh, assets, the JavaScript, the images, everything. Um, so this case is kind of straightforward, but let's say you have, um, you have many products, 23 products. You need to have an HTML file of that product uh, products.23.html. If you have 1,000 products, you need 1,000 HTML files. So it really, uh, this technique for static export depends on the type of application you want. It works well if you don't have that many uh, pages, but if you have 1,000 products, 2,000 products, you have to recreate all these pages uh, by running a similar script to what I showed you before, and then you uh, will be able to uh, have them in a static server. By the way, uh, you see products.23.html. Um, you can predefy the URL by just calling products-23. But like in the most simpler version, uh, you need to put the extension of the file. So let's take a look at how we look with a server-side rendering. Uh, it's going to be similar to static export, but we're going to use something like Express or Koa or even just raw Node.js to render our um, HTML. So in this case, we import the React DOM. We have the products, the same um, page that before, and we create a handler for a specific route. So let's say we have uh, slash products and what this is going to do is when the user hits slash products, whatever is in this function is going to execute. So he, the user hit this route and we create the HTML as before and then we just send it. So the benefit here is that um, we could like extract some parameters and create some dynamic routes. So we will, we will need to create like multiple uh, HTML files. It will look like this. Uh, our dynamic server is usually going to be like a Node.js server. There are other options like in other languages, Ruby, uh, PHP, but like by default, the normal usage is with Node.js. 
So let's say the user goes to product slash 23. At this point, the server is going to create the HTML on the fly. So it's going to create uh, HTML every single time that the user um, hits this route or any route. And then we send it to the user and then the same process repeats. It's going to fetch the JavaScript, the, I mean the front end JavaScript, the images, CSS, etc. Um, so just remember, like in general, it's uh, the pattern is you use render um, render to string to generate the HTML, and then on the client you use React DOM .hydrate, and you add like the event listeners and everything on top. So why is this any better? Remember our example from before. Um, it's going to be a slightly bit different. We start fetching our HTML. It's going to take, in this case, more time than before because our HTML is going to be huge. It's going to contain everything. The, the, all the tags, all the, the, the products, all the information is going to be there. So it's not going to be as fast as downloading just the tiny HTML. As soon as this starts fetching, uh, as our HTML finds the script tag, uh, it's going to start fetching our JavaScript. A little disclaimer, this is not by default. If you put a script tag on the head, it's going to block the rendering of the HTML, but you can put like a prefetch, and it could do like what I'm, I'm showing here. So uh, let's say at one second, your user is going to get the whole HTML, so he can see that, okay, I have a fully rendered application. I can read, I can see the images, I can like scroll. He can do a lot of stuff, not every stuff, but uh, he has the most, uh, most of the information that he needs. And at the same time, JavaScript is still downloading, but we have our first meaningful pain. So that same user that wanted to go to Spotify or talk with his friends is now in our app and maybe it's going to buy something, so that's good for us. Now, uh, the same process is going to be, the JavaScript download process is going to be the same. It's going to be the same size, and the script evaluation is going to take the same amount of time. Um, so at this point, it's kind of like the same as before, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but let's say because it doesn't have to construct the whole HTML from scratch, uh, it's going to be a little bit faster. So we just do a rehydration phase, and we have a fully interactive website. So the user can just start uh, using your application as is as it meant to be. So, uh, why does it help SEO? Anybody has any ideas? The faster it is, the better it's like for search results. That's that's uh, one of the main reasons. Yeah. Anybody else? Danny, you you don't come. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> HTML format as in .js. Yes. Actually, the SPA is also gonna be an HTML, but it's gonna be empty. So Google, uh, as big as it is, is great, but they have limited resources. Uh, it's faster for them to parse a website that is already rendered than uh, using JavaScript to render that. So what they do, uh, this is like, Google is kind of like a black box. Nobody knows for sure uh, how it works, but this is something that uh, people has been able to figure out based on how it uh, seems to work on the outside. But if your application is like SPA and Google goes fetches and says, okay, this guy is just having an empty HTML and JavaScript to generate this. It's going to put your website on a queue. And this queue is go you're going to be on hold for at least three days. Uh, so for example, if you're releasing, adding a new product to your website, uh, nobody, the world won't, won't know about it because it's going to be on a queue for three days until Google finds resources for it. Once it finds resources, it's going to say, OK, I'm now going to render this JavaScript version of your application. I'm going to see it. OK, all good. Now it's going to add you to the 
uh, result. But in the meantime, you might lose some customers. It might be bad for your whole project itself. Um, and in general, it's three days, but it could be more. So ideally, if your app is already uh, fully working HTML, it's going to be better for uh, your project because they're going to, OK, parse it fast, and they're going to see, as you say, um, OK, this pa page is loading fast, so it's going to give some priority to this guy. Uh, but if you, if you have just SPA, it's going to work, but it's not going to be the best. It really depends what type of uh, project you have. If it's a personal project, it's OK. Uh, but if you're selling uh, thousands of products and you need them to be available, then you need server-side rendering. Usually, e-commerce websites should be server-side render. Uh, so, yeah. Oh God! <laughs> Is there somebody in Hangouts? <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna start from the beginning. <laughs> no, they they will kill me here. So. Um, I hope at least the illustrations were uh, pretty and fun. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, what does it help SEO? Because it's gonna um, Google is gonna not put you in this queue, and it doesn't matter that much. But if you care about other search engine uh, search engines they might not be as, as good as Google are rendering JavaScript. And uh, one extra thing, usually the Google bot is not the latest version of Google Chrome. So if you have something that is like cutting edge, it might not even appear on the version that they can render. So that's something to consider. Now, uh, this is going to be a bit quicker, but the SML is uh, social media optimization. and it's mo it mostly matters because when you sometimes try to use a share system that you hey, share this page on Twitter, Facebook, or similar, uh, you might find that if it's an SPA, uh, these services might not be able to create like a pre-render version of your application. Um, and they will probably have to fall back to what you have defined in like OG tags. Um, so it's, it's usually also good to, to have server-side rendering if you care about um, social media, especially if your per pages are being shared across their networks. So if it is all great, why not everybody's using server-side rendering? Like there are like huge benefits, uh, but the truth is that it's not a painless process. It's um, so it's really up to you to decide if it makes sense to go to the extra for, for uh, implementing this. So let's, let's take a look. It will increase the complexity of your application, that's for sure. Um, let's say uh, things like that you give for granted, like hot model reloading, um, page pleading, and many other stuff are extremely difficult to do with server-side rendering, especially if you're just doing it by yourself. It, it can get very complicated, very complex, and there is probably not as uh, many documentation as there is for client uh, SPAs. So um, a way to minimize this is to use a framework. What we use here in SRB uh, is uh, framework called Next.js is probably the most popular server-side rendering framework out there, and it's gonna help. It's gonna help us a lot by providing this whole model reloading that works not only in the client but with the with the server. Uh, some cool ways to do code splitting, um, and many many other stuff, and we're gonna cover uh, Next.js in in a bit in, in the live demo. This only applies to server-side rendering, not static export. But we're going to have increased response times. Because this uh, creating an HTML out of 
a React app on the server is like a CPU intensive process. If any of you are like backend or you work with Node.js, you probably know that one of the worst thing you could do to Node.js is like block the event loop by doing something like this. So it's uh, the more requests that you have, the slower it's gonna get. And a request that could take 100 milliseconds could easily take 500 milliseconds. And if you're fetching some data on the server from a third party API or your own API, the server has to wait for this API to complete for, and then render what you have and then send it to users. So instead of waiting a uh, hundred milliseconds, you're using my wait one second, two seconds, three seconds, five seconds. It really depends on how, uh, uh, what are you doing, but you're gonna have this. This is something that you need to find a way to solve or at least minimize. And the way to do it is that you should cache the request on the server. Now, um, there are some pages that like, literally there's no problem by not caching it, that they're so small that it really doesn't matter. Um, but this is something that you should normally do. Now, uh, how caching works, this is like a most simple version of a cache, but it's quite simple in general. You can use something very advanced like varnish on top or like, um, uh, different or more advanced system just specifically made for this. But in general, you just have like an object, a cache um, uh, let variable. And once the user hits the products endpoint, it's gonna check, okay, do I have, it's gonna check the URL. Do I have this URL uh, in my cache? If it has it, it's gonna contain the HTML and it's gonna send it to the, to the user. Now let's say, okay, I don't have it, so I'm gonna go to the process I showed you before, I'm gonna get this HTML, I'm gonna store in my cache for the next request, and now I'm gonna send it. It's extremely simple, but this only works for unauthenticated routes, so like public facing pages. You're not gonna cache uh, your users, like specific users, um, route, so you need a way to uh, filter that, okay, this page is a slash account, okay, I'm not gonna store that. Uh, that one, I'm just gonna create it on the fly or I'm just not gonna server-side render it. So you also need a way to invalidate that cache because let's say you have uh, a list of uh, the first page of your product's cache and you added 10 new products that they should be featured, uh, but the users are hitting your cache and okay, that's also no good. Um, so ideally you create like an endpoint. There are way, different ways to do it, but this is like the simplest way. Uh, you have an endpoint, uh, let's say, slash invalidate cache and your backend, let's, specifically your, your admin website. Every time it uh, hits, let's say, update products or get products, it's gonna call invalidate cache. So it will, uh, you can make it very specific. Okay, if a uh, new product is added, it's just gonna invalidate products page, not let's say um, FIQ page or other stuff. So, uh, but uh, you will have to put some security mechanism to avoid people from deleting your cache, which will not be good. Now, one of the most ignore problems of SSR, I think like most of the people ignore it, even Airbnb has uh, this problem and they say they're gonna be working on uh, solving this, is that you will get a false sense of interactivity. You have your fully paint app, the user is happy, and he goes, okay, now let's uh, look for React and start clicking and like, is it doesn't work, nothing works because there's no JavaScript, like literally there's not, nothing happening. So uh, he gets pretty frustrated, like it's kind of remind me like the story of the raccoon that tries to get this, he's all happy and they're like, not, like he lost this thing. So if you don't want like angry users, you better start thinking about how to solve this. And the way to solve this is something called progressive enhancement. What does it mean? We're gonna, like the parts that, that 
are not going to be interactive. We're going to run, uh, give the user a hint that, hey, this part is, is not working at this moment or is working uh, in a minimal version. So for example, we have the same example here, but we can put a loader on the bottom so the user will know, okay, I can use the app, but I, at least I know that this might not work because there is a loader. If you have like a navigation and it only works with JavaScript, then uh, instead of relying fully on JavaScript, maybe try to make it work with CSS. Maybe it won't be as fancy, but at least the user could open the menu and go to the website uh, to the link they want. So in general, this is something you have to consider all the time because you might do more damage than good if you don't take this into account. So, time for live coding. So this is the part when I do a lot of mistakes. Um, so, let's get started. Uh, but before moving on, like uh, regarding the presentation itself, does anybody have questions that maybe we can address before jumping into the code? Okay, I'm gonna wait five seconds. Five, four, three. <laughs> no, okay. Probably you still think processing the TypeScript from from the previous lesson. Like, what is this guy talking about? I'm I'm just in still in, in the type thing. So, oh uh, wait. Uh, is it big enough? Okay. So let's uh, do like some minor example here. Uh, let's say we have, um, this is not going to work, this is just for illustration purposes. Uh, let's say we have a file called default.ssr.js and we're gonna call this with Node.js. We're gonna run it with Node.js. And we import React, we import React on server, and we import one of our pages. It doesn't matter which page it is. And we have a handler here. So let's say we want to create a route for, um, let's say, our products. Oh, well, in this case, it's product detail. So it could, be, let's say this one is not product detail, but product list. I think it's called. Cool. Yeah. So let's say the user is gonna come here and let's try doing what I showed you before. Let's say we have an HTML here and we're gonna call React some server. There is this render to string, there is also Render to node stream. Does anybody uh, know what streams are in Node.js? Sam, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna explain a bit, but here um, we're gonna pass or products and we're gonna call rest.send with this HTML. Now, this is all good. This is the same I showed you before. But if we, we go to products, uh, if we go to products, which should be in the source, uh, product list, uh, we know that we have some data here and this is the product list. So we kind of have a problem because this is, React does, is not going to wait. React uh, render to string is not going to call any life cycle. Uh, it's not going to call a component mount, it's not going to call a component did update, and it's not going to call your hooks on the server. It's just going to care about what you render. The rest is going to 
Like it doesn't matter if you here uh, say fetch products. It's not. It's gonna call it, but it's not going to wait. It's just gonna. Okay, I, I'm gonna call this, and now I'm gonna return because there is a list right now. There is no way to do like a sync component. Uh, this is like a synchronous method, and whenever you call something asynchronous in JavaScript, it's just gonna go to the next line and it's gonna ignore this. It's not going to wait. So we have a problem because before we had um, this use um, APL, use API hook that was just being called here. And then uh, once the data was there, it, it was going to show you the product here. But because it's not gonna wait, uh, it will work, like it will do the fetching, it will, uh, but the server is not gonna wait for the data to respond, it's just gonna create the HTML and the end user would just have like a partially created HTML. So how do we solve this? Like uh, there should be a way for us to like wait for this. Um, there is like not current way like built into React to wait for this. So there are like workarounds. Um, so what we could do, it's let's say, uh, let's say we have a sync function here and let's say, okay, we cannot wait inside React. Let's wait in the server. So we could do something like this products and we will call, um, this is just like kind of a fake um, code, so don't worry about it. Uh, but let's say we fetch our products here, and now that we have it here, okay, now we have our data. So, okay, let's uh, let's pass the list of our products here, and now this component has everything it needs. And let's say we will have these products here and we will use it here. Or like, uh, this guy's actually expecting REST. So let's say this is called REST. And that's it. We have data that we pass. But this is a little bit inconvenient to like um, start creating all these data fetching on your handlers on the server. Like we, we're supposed to be front end developers, not like back end. Uh, so kind of like the middle ground um, that at least Next.js is using, there are other uh, ways to, to solve this, is that we can define a static method in, uh, or compounding. A static method is just uh, we go to the function, like product is a function at this point, and we add an extra property. Uh, so we call this function get initial props. And here we're just gonna put some, a bunch of logic. I already have it defined here. Uh, as you can see, it's an async function and it's gonna have the same logic that you had before um, for waiting uh, to, to fetch the products. So we're just gonna wait for the APL call, fetch products, rest. And once we have it, we could eat it, pass it directly. It's perfectly fine. Uh, but I also wanted to show you how we'll, you will add this data to Redux. So for example, here you have your REST and you, um, this guy has this store magically in there. Um, so we just dispatch the action with the data we want. Now, how the server knows like where to get this, it's quite easy, it's pretty much what I just did before. Instead of calling away.fetch, it's gonna have like uh, find the get initial props. And 
yeah, magically we're gonna pass some data. Next is gonna do that, but like in the simplest version, uh, we're gonna just do this and just spread the properties that we get from uh, from calling this. So it's really important that get initial props is at the top level. Because let's say you have it wrapped with connect, you have it wrapped with other higher order components, that then this get initial props, if you add it to this one, is gonna be trapped inside all these higher order components. And then the server won't be able to find this function because it's like trapped inside. Um, there are helpers to hoist or like move up this um, static method, but in general, try to just put it uh, on the top. So this is uh, how it look if you have to do it by yourself. Uh, if you're not, not using Next.js, but it's gonna look something similar. It's just that we're gonna have like more support for other stuff. So um, we're gonna start by creating um, this folder called server. And inside we're gonna put an index.js. This is not actually um, always required, uh, only when we have like dynamic routes, but we have different products, so we need it. So what we do when we have dynamic routes is for example, here is products routes, and we just specify the structure of the route with the ID, the name, and we're gonna tell it, okay, this is the route, but I'm going, uh, I want you to find a specific file that is not going to be called products.id.name. It's just going to be .product.js. And we're going to pass the params. The params is whatever you pass here. So if you have like pass like 34 or like, uh, this is what it's going to be in the params uh, as an object like id. This is what it's going to be there. So, um, because of what I was showing you, uh, the limitation that we actually kind of need to get access to get initial props, uh, we actually need, need like the, the actual page. Oh, wait, I lost this server. Okay, we actually need access to the actual page. And that's why I have like a really sad news for you, but we cannot use React Router because we need individual pages. We cannot have like a app here because if we need the products, get initial props, app is not going to know, like it, it's like generic, so it doesn't know which app, uh, which route are you looking for at this moment. Uh, so Next.js yes needs a way for you to, to pass specifically routes uh, as files. So it's not convenient, uh, but it could be quite powerful uh, just to support this. So you're gonna see here that we have a pages file living next to um, source. And here, uh, we're gonna have just a file. For example, product detail is just gonna import product detail and then it's gonna export it. Product list, same thing. Uh, there's, I, you could put the logic here, you could create a component here, but ideally, this is something where you just import the, the files. For example, here we have uh, the home page, and it's also the uh, products list. If we had defined our components here, uh, we could not be able to, we'll have to either duplicate the logic or import from one from the other. But it's better that you just keep everything on, on as it is in the source folder. Uh, so yeah, technically each one route per every, uh, each uh, file per every route. So it's not gonna look as nice and it's not gonna be as manageable as React Router, but that's the way it is. And I hope you understand um, based on, uh, on this. 
Uh, any questions so far? Please do, I need to get some water. <laughs> Just think about it. This is not awkward. Still not awkward. Okay. Kostya, you ruined these people. So, um, the changes that we need to do is that we need to remove the application and entry point that we had before um, to use React Router. Sorry, to not use React Router. And there, um, so let's uh, take a better look at um, this endpoint here. This product ID name is going to call products, um, single product. And this one is product detail. And if we check product detail, uh, we're going to see that we have, it's pretty much the same as before, but we have this get initial props. And so we get, uh, in this context, we get past the store, we get past the query, and other stuff like the request itself. So here we can check. Before we had like a, some complicated rundown to just get the ID. Here we just get like context query, that ID, we fetch the product, we wait, and we load it into the store. Now at this moment, we don't have, um, uh, because the loading was uh, done before by the hook, like the loading state. Um, right now, we don't have a way to do it. Um, so we need to use something else. And please think about it because this is going to be part of your homework. Um, so uh, at this point, no loader is going to show, but the rest is going to be uh, exactly the same. The other thing that did change is uh, links before we were using react router. So we now to use we need to use react links uh, Sorry next yes links. They are almost the same uh, I honestly don't know why but you need to add the anchor tags inside as opposed to just having it like this as before um, It's a requirement and you put the href here. So the href is gonna be the name that matches uh, the pages folder. So this one uh, is going to be products slash products. But if we check the products endpoint, the products uh, page, it's going to be a bit different. And this is going to get a bit complicated, maybe. The link here is going to look, uh, oh, it's inside product. Yeah. We have two routes. One is called href, and this is the one that should match the name of the file that you have. And the other one is called as. As is like the pretty, the nice version of a route. This is what the user will see on the URL. But this is what uh, the href is what actually Next.js is going to use internally. So you could use it like this, uh, but your routes will look like this. And you don't want that. So you can create like pretty routes. And this, uh, this is really important. This as route, it has to match uh, the server route that you specify. But other than that, there are like uh, no big changes in, in your components. Um, the other thing is that in the browser, you have access to the window. There's no window on the server, like the window object. Uh, so for example, local storage and other stuff are not available on the server. If you try to access them, uh, your server is going to blow up, it's going to crash, and like your users are going to get angry. So you need to make sure that Libraries that you import, don't use this or try to put a conditional if you're importing a library that relies on this. Or for example, we were using on the utils, uh, we were using here in utils, uh, I think it's this one. 
yeah, any of uh, refresh token, for example. We are using this Windows local storage. Uh, we need like a check before accessing this because some of your, maybe all your code will run on the backend, uh, but even if it doesn't, uh, it's not gonna do anything for it. But if we, um, what we want to avoid is getting errors on the server. So we created like a helper and the helper is quite simple. It's just gonna check if type of window is not undefined. If it is not undefined, it can safely um, access like local storage and whatever else you expect from uh, your web application. Um, and okay, what else? The other thing that it's uh, really important is that we have two special files uh, that are exclusive, exclusively from Next.js and they are like document, um, underscore document. Um, this code is just like copy paste it or find it online and the official Next.js documentation. Uh, this is just to service I render um, style components because style components are like also like uh, created at runtime. Uh, we need a way to collect this um, styles and add it to the, to the final HTML. So this is just for that. It, don't worry too much about it, but you need to create it. And the other thing is that we need this special file called app uh, underscore app. In this case, is gonna find this, the same app that we had, but we change it like a lot. Uh, we need this special higher order component called with Redux. Uh, we're just gonna add it here. It expects a special setup of configure store. So we also had to uh, change it a little bit. And again, uh, we kind of call like um, Redux dev extensions without checking its browser. So you always have to take care of like checking what is on the browser, what is not on the browser. Um, so we had to change a little bit the, the shape of this. So you could check it later in the code. Um, but in general, there are like, there are more like configuration changes than logic changes. Um, even if we're changing the use API hook for the get initial props, in general, it's gonna be the same. Um, also, we changed this uh, public folder that we have. It's ha it has to be named static. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's uh, pretty much it. There are some extra configuration files here to support TypeScript, CSS, um, in general, but that's it. Uh, let's uh, take a look at, if we check or like this, before uh, the HTML like was kind of empty, but if we go and check like the page source, we can see that all the products that appear here and all the CSS, all the HTML, uh, it is gonna be here. So Googlebot will be able to um, find everything by the route and the users will be happy. Now, um, I'm sad nobody has asked yet, but maybe I'm gonna ask like, what do, what do you guys think about like um, the private part of the application? For example, my account, should we server-side render that? Should we not? Okay, who says yes? Any hands? One hand, okay. So everybody who say no, like why do you think it's not a good thing? I'm looking at you. Huh? I don't know. Okay. Anybody? I'm not sure. Okay. Is it because of when you want to edit something, you don't want to send it to server to store it and send it back to the client? Um, yeah. There are like, the first reason is what I mentioned before about cache. Yeah. So that's, I think, similar to what you were saying. Um, you don't want to have like, a million users and have their pages 
store in the cache of your server. You could do it, but it's not ideal. The second thing is that um, it cannot be done like by default because you need to log in the user on the server. How you do that? Right now we are using uh, session storage to store a token, but if we had like a, we decide to use instead of cookies, cookies are sent on every request. So if the server um, gets that request to my account and sees that okay there is a cookie, I'm gonna use this token, I'm gonna do the same process I'm doing in front end. I'm just gonna log in the user on the back end just for that single request. And then I'm gonna um, uh, service I render that. That's something you could do, uh, but it usually, uh, it really depends on how important it is. Uh, normally I would recommend like don't bother doing this because it's like an extra overhead. And as I mentioned, it's more about like the initial low, like the first time your user has like contact with your application. If he's already a customer, he already is purchasing your stuff, he probably have the app in, in the cache, he might wait a little bit just to see his orders. It's not like a big deal. But if you want to do it, uh, because it really depends, it, it's up to you, it's a business decision. If you want to do it, then uh, you would need to change the, the system that we use for storing um, recession by using cookies. And yeah, I guess that's, um, that's pretty much it, guys. There are like some resources I have here. There is uh, another library called Gatsby.js. It's, uh, it's pretty good. It's gonna do a similar thing as Next.js. It's gonna work in a similar fashion, but it's gonna use GraphQL to fetch the data. There are ways around it, but it, you're supposed to do GraphQL. We don't supposed to know GraphQL. Uh, so it's, it's better that I just leave it as a resource. Um, Gatsy is focused on the static export. Uh, you could do server-side rendering, but it's not like their main goal. With Next.js, you could do both. You could do server-side render, or you could hit like npm, uh, run some command and it will generate all the um, HTML files for you. And there are like um, other bunch of resources for you to, to check. So that's, um, that's it. So let's, uh, I hope you have questions. Finally, or not. Okay, one question over there. What is going to actually happen? When you start a server, it will appear on the main screen, right? And when you click on the specific route, uh, all the content will get re-rendered, or it will just appear like in React way. It will just appear in like no no second. Uh, if you're opening for the first time, you go through a browser with the empty page. Yes. Like you have this, and I decided to check this website. This is uh, rendered by the server and it's gonna look like this. But when you're changing routes, uh, it's gonna use React. Okay. So from the fr after the first time you load it, it's, it's just gonna be an SPA, it's not gonna change, that's it. But just for the first load is where uh, the server side renders. So right here, I'm just not like refreshing. There is a flash here, but it's not, because of this, it's like a bug with the stall components but it's definitely not re-rendering or like it's not uh, getting the data again from the server. It's just about the, the first time. Okay, good question. 10 points to Gryffindor. <laughs> so anybody else? No, this is the time. Then you will regret it. Why didn't I ask something? No. Okay, Danny has a question. What about security and concerns? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Now that you have a server, you kind of have to be, I mean, you'd be like having a server in between your actual backend API and the front end. So you have to worry about some stuff about security 
that probably you didn't have to worry about before. So uh, actually here in the resources, I think uh, you will have to, no, no there. You have to worry about, um, there is this thing called uh, helmet. It's for Express, but there are similar things for Core or whatever you want to use. Uh, it will provide you with some um, utility functions to help you against XS, X cross-site scripting attacks um, and other type of stuff um, by having like some sensitive defaults. Uh, but yeah, once you have a server, you have to worry about that people don't abuse the server. So uh, there's something extra. That's why I said there will be increased complexity. That's something that you also have to consider. So uh, learn a little bit about it and learn a bit about how securing um, servers. Now there, there won't be like extreme uh, potential for exploiting your servers or you won't have like direct access to database and all this stuff. You will be fetching your stuff through um, um, to, uh, API, you could put like a, you could connect to a database and fetch everything in, in the handlers, but that's a, that's a really bad idea. So don't do it. So just uh, rely on fetching the things as you will do on the front end. But yeah, that's something that you will consider. I don't know if Danny, you have uh, something extra to share? No? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, so that's it. I hope you like it and that you learn something useful.